Not everybody loves to be part of a community, and not everyone likes being amongst others. Those people would love to live in places featured in this lineup, because from desolate landscapes to remote islands, these videos are a virtual passport to the planet's loneliest corners. Today we'll explore some of the most beautiful and isolated crevices on Earth, and the serene places where the most introverted of introverts can prosper and be themselves. These are the most isolated places on Earth. Number 20. Stannard Rock Lighthouse Now, depending on the location of a lighthouse, it doesn't have to be an isolated place. There are plenty of lighthouses that are on dry land, or things like hills, as the point of a lighthouse is quite simple. It's meant to be a kind of beacon that allows oncoming ships to know where the shoreline is, or when to avoid certain danger. The latter one is the perfect definition of the Stannard Rock Lighthouse, which is located on Lake Superior. But why is this location known as the loneliest place on the continent? Well, that's because once upon a time, it was one of the most dangerous places in all of the entire lake, as there's a massive reef there that used to gum up ships. As maritime activity increased in the 1800s, the potential dangers of the reef would grow. It was just south of the Salt to Duluth shipping lane, and mariners dubbed it one of the most treacherous reefs in the entire Great Lake. Enter legendary navigator Captain Charles C. Stenard, who was the man who realized that there was a place where you could build a lighthouse, and so you could station someone there to ensure that ships don't hit the reefs and put their crews in danger. It's a noble endeavor, and something like that should be praised. However, no good deed goes unpunished. Unlike many lighthouses, this one is literally surrounded by water and is many miles away from land. It's so isolated that at its peak usage, it's usually considered to be a punishment to go and be stationed there, and that punishment has led to lots of damages to the lighthouse by nature itself. It would take five long and difficult years and a cost of more than $300,000 to build the lighthouse. Every spring, repairs have to be made to the previous year's work because of winter storm and ice damage. So just imagine being the only person in that lighthouse when the storms begin to rage outside. Those who were in it had many of a tale to tell, and that's why they were fine getting off of that rock even if it meant leaving in a straitjacket. While the lighthouse isn't functional anymore, its legend does still remain, and some still seek to preserve it for historical purposes. Before we go on, like this video, smash the subscribe button, and click the notification bell right now, or this centipede will crawl on your face when you're sleeping. Now it's time for the sweet topic. You shouldn't need me to tell you this, given the evidence that's in this image, but this lighthouse is one of the most isolated places in the world. Sitting atop an incredibly tiny island somewhere near Ireland, not only is it remote, but it's caught amidst fierce winds and harsh rains and an intense chill. Somebody always has to be there, though. The job of running a lighthouse is important, after all. It's a vital job for guiding ships to the mainland, but the seclusion and environment are not for everyone. Thankfully, they found someone to run it. Martin O'Shea is an introverted loner, jokingly describing himself as having a deep-seated hatred for people. He's been running the place for decades in total isolation and loving it, but the problem is, he's not getting any younger, and someone's going to have to replace him. The question is, who? Would you be up for it? As always, you can let me know your thoughts in the comments section down below by using the hashtag SweetTopic. Number 19. Sagiria Rock Now you may be surprised how many people go to great lengths to try and build buildings and cities and monuments and so on in very high places, one of which can be found in Sri Lanka. Sagiria Rock is an ancient rock fortress and palace that was built by a king during his reign of 473 to 495, which stands majestically 200 meters straight off the ground and on a large plateau. Just to get up to the peak, you have to climb over 1,200 steps, which some of you might like because it means you're getting your exercise in for the day. Today, the Rock Fortress is one of the most famous treasures of the region and is actually a UNESCO World Heritage Site 
meaning that it's under their protection to keep as a key part of history. And if you ask the locals, they'll totally agree that it deserves to be preserved. In their minds, the Rock Fortress is not only a national treasure, it's the unofficial eighth wonder of the world. Every year, thousands of people go to this rock to check it out and see the views from on high. And when you look at these pictures and videos of that view, it's not hard to see why they would want to see it with their own eyes. The fortress complex includes remnants of a ruined palace, surrounded by an extensive network of fortifications, vast gardens, ponds, canals, alleys, and fountains. Ironically, there used to be another entrance to the fortress, and it was a massive lion's head with paws that were poking out of the rock. But sadly today, only the paws remain, but it's still cool to see. Number 18. The Korowai Tribe there are certain truths about our world that many people either would not believe or simply couldn't understand how it was possible to happen. For example, given our modern age, you may think that it's impossible that there are still ancient tribes living in the most basic of ways in certain parts of the world. I mean, after all, the maps have been drawn in, right? Except that's not true, as places like Papua New Guinea have vast spans of forests that are home to not only animals, but to groups of people like the Korowai tribe. To further show you how isolated they were, there's no contact between them and the outside world until the 1970s, and it's even believed that the tribe literally didn't know that there was an outside world with all sorts of people until contact would first be made. Now that's really isolated when you don't know the world around you exists, but their way of life is more mind-boggling than just that. For example, they build tree houses that are over 40 meters off the ground. Why so high? Well, they also wanted to ensure their safety in case rival tribes came to get them, which is not a bad tactic, unless the enemy tribes try to literally burn the house down. But they actually planned for that, putting in safety precautions to prevent such an action. And you should not expect members of the tribe to interact with people now that they know the wider world is out there, because they think that everyone has evil spirits within them. Given some of the people that live in the world, it's not really an inaccurate statement to make now, is it? Number 17. The World's Loneliest House now there's a moniker that most people would not want. I mean, after all, there's a difference between wanting a home that is far away from the hustle and bustle of the city or wanting to be away from the noisy community, and then there's wanting a place where there's virtually nobody. The house in question that I'm addressing is on an island that's off the coast of Iceland. And as you can see in the picture, it is a literal house sitting in the literal middle of said island with nothing else around it. Hence why you can understand that it got the title of World's Loneliest House. So who put that house there and why does it still exist? Well, believe it or not, the house was originally built for a hunter's club. I mean it, they were hunting puffin on the island and the house was their home base. The people who did eventually live there actually survived on puffins, as well as through fishing and raising cows, and the final full-timers left in the 1930s, and no one's been there since. It's not really all that difficult to see why it wouldn't be the easiest place to live in. Due to its isolation, it doesn't even have electricity, running water, or any other amenities that people would call vital. Though ironically, it does have a sauna, one that's powered by the island's rainwater, because clearly those in isolation needed a spa day. Number 16, Devon Island. Now, if you thought the last nickname for an isolated location was bad, wait until you hear the one for Devon Island in Canada. They literally call it Mars on Earth. The island in question is in the Canadian Arctic Archipelago, and it's the largest uninhabited island in the world. That's because it's not a place that's easily inhabited. The ground remains frozen for almost the entire year, particularly the eastern third of the island, which is permanently covered by an ice cap some 500 to 7 meters thick. And the temperature, well, it doesn't even get above 10 degrees Celsius all year long, its average being 16 degrees below. And as for that nickname, its conditions, nearly lifeless, and frozen ground are a near-perfect match for what you might find on Mars. Thus, scientists go there to do research to see if they can use it to potentially help figure out solutions for colonizing Mars. And if that works, well, I salute you, scientists. Number 15. Alcatraz 
Now we'll change things up a little bit and talk arguably about one of the most iconic locations in the world, that being Alcatraz Island. When you make a prison, the isolation is one of many factors that is meant to force the prisoners to behave and not to escape. But how you present that isolation can take many forms. For Alcatraz, they literally put the prison on an island off the coast of San Francisco and basically dared the prisoners to try to escape it. Because even if you could get out of that prison, then you'd have to figure out a way to get from the rock to the shoreline without drowning and getting caught. It's not an easy feat. In fact, they stated that the prison has never had a successful escape. Many have tried, pretty much all of them have died or been caught in the attempt, and it was so infamous that it even housed the legendary Al Capone. But let's ask a more broad question now. If the prison was so effective, why isn't it still active today? Well, that's because the upkeep for a prison on an island is not easy, and because of its construction, it was slowly rotting from the inside out. Eventually, they moved the prisoners to other locations, and the island has since been used for many things over the years, including a museum and the set for a certain Nicolas Cage movie. Its legend has become so great that Mythbusters actually dedicated one of their earliest episodes to seeing if the tale of three men escaping the island was feasible. They made a raft out of raincoats and used the natural currents of the bay to get to the Marin headlands, so perhaps Alcatraz was not as impenetrable and inescapable as they thought. The truth, ironically, will never escape its walls. Number 14. Abuna Yamada Gu. Believe it or not, there are numerous places in the world that have temples and other religious sanctuaries that are located not on the flat ground, but high up in the air on plateaus, or in the case of this place, within a cave inside of a massive rock structure. You'll find this particular church in Ethiopia, and it's pretty much inaccessible to anyone who is not brave enough to make the trek. It's situated at a height of over 2,000 meters and has to be climbed on foot in order to reach it. It's notable for its dome and beautiful wall paintings that date back to the 5th century and its architecture as well. And so if you're brave enough, you can find a unique place to worship at the end of it all, but we're sure that some of you would simply prefer just to drive to your local church. Number 13. Skorsbesund. Now, to be clear, the actual name of this place is much more complicated to say, so I'm going to spare my tongue and your ears and call it by its former name, Skorsbesun. But what is this oddly named place? Well, it's a small town in Greenland, which should instantly make clear how isolated that it could be. After all, Greenland is one of the most inhospitable places on Earth due to the weather conditions, and the people there only live in certain places of the country. This particular town is the only inhabited place south of Greenland National Park, and believe it or not, they do welcome visitors. There's a hotel that you can even bunk in. It's not a bad hotel at all. The people seem to like living there as well. They all have electricity and central heating and Wi-Fi in the local rec center, and order parcels from Amazon that arrive by charter plane once every two months from Iceland. Iceland. They do make it work, so really, who are we to judge? Number 12. Tristan da Cunha Continuing on, we now head to South Africa, where off the coast, 2,700 kilometers away from Cape Town, you're going to find Tristan da Cunha. What is that? Well, it's the most remote yet inhabited archipelago you'll ever see. And if you want to get out there, going by boat is going to be your only option. It's a six day trek from Cape Town to get there, so you would best be prepared for the long haul. Despite the isolation, the people of the archipelago make it work just fine. They grow their own food, they have a church, a school, a post office, a swimming pool, and a Wi-Fi cafe and more. There's even a fund for students so that they can travel to the UK or Cape Town to further their education. Part of the archipelago is even protected by UNESCO. Number 11. Principality of Sealand. Doesn't it sound like the most official thing ever? Oh, hello there. We're from the Principality of Sealand. Bask in our glory. But it's so much more than just a fancy title. Created by a disgruntled pirate radio broadcaster named Paddy Roy Bates in 1967, Sealand is an unrecognized micronation in the North Sea with its very own constitution, national flag, and passport. There are many jokes that I would love to make here, but honestly, I think it's just kind of cool that a so-called pirate did it all. Come on. Woo. 
The irony is that this micronation isn't that big at all. In fact, it's smaller than the size of a football field, but sometimes, just sometimes, size doesn't matter. Oh, and the Bates family, well, they've made it very clear that they're not only the rulers of the land, but they're basically royalty. The current living members of the family refer to themselves as princes, and they use sea land to run business operations. What a world we live in. Number 10. Takt Sang Monastery. Now, as noted earlier, there are many religious areas that are built in isolated places. Another such place can be found in Paro Valley, Bhutan, and it's a beautiful monastery. But to the world at large, it's known more popularly as the Tiger's Nest Monastery. <laughs> This monastery is incredibly up high. I'm talking over 800 meters above the valley. So if you want to hike your way up there, it's going to take you between two to three hours. You better make sure that you bring water and snacks so that you can stay energized. As you go up to the monastery, you're going to pass flags from the religion in question. They're meant to bless you on your way up, so be grateful for that. And as you get there, you will have quite a view. So it's something to definitely be cherished in the end. Number 9. Easter Island Now let's talk about another famous island called Easter Island, which is off the coast of Chile, technically, and is one of the most interesting and unique islands in the world. It's home to one of the biggest mysteries in the world via the culture that's crafted by the island's inhabitants, the Rapa Nui. But I'll be focusing on the island's location, because when I say that this island is isolated from the world, I mean that in one of the most broad senses possible. If you were to find it on a map, you would quickly realize that it's far away from Chile. And so you can't really say that it's off the coast because it's a thousand miles away from any other landmass in basically any direction. That's one of the biggest mysteries right there. When did the Rapa Nui first make it to this island? Many debates have gone on about it over time, but regardless, it's estimated that European settlers arrived around 1722, and that's when the island became both a fascination to those who found it, and it started the devastation of the people itself. It's said that there were a couple thousand people living on that island until the colonizers came, and about 150 years later, there was only around 100. Colonization, yay! Getting back to the mystery, the people of the Rapa Nui made legendary statues that were scattered all over the island, and these have been studied heavily over the years, because they had made over a thousand of them, and there was no clear reason at first for how they did it and why. And that's not to mention that their language hasn't even been decoded yet. So much of their history is still an unknown. Even still, people go to Easter Island to research and explore, even if it's not exactly the easiest place to get to. Number 8. The Katshi Pillar now we're heading to Georgia to look at the Katshi Pillar. Not the state of Georgia in the United States, the country. There is a big difference, trust me. And when you get to the area where the pillar is, you'll definitely not miss it, as it sticks out like a sore thumb amidst all of the other scenery. And would you like to guess what stands atop that 40 meter pillar? You guessed it, it's a church. You have to wonder why these churches make their followers go through such lengths to reach them. There are monks that live at the base of the pillar, and every day they climb a ladder straight up so that they can say their prayers for the day and then they come back down. They say that the whole experience helps them to uh, feel closer to God. Number 7. Cape York Peninsula Cape York Peninsula is a peninsula located in far north Queensland, Australia. But more importantly, it's an untouched wilderness that is the largest of its kind in the northern part of the country. Which I'm psyched about. Yeah. I can't believe this, but I like it. I mean, seriously, man doesn't even have much of a place there, and half of the area is dedicated to cattle. It's so untouched are these areas that they're protected by various governments, all to ensure that they don't become harmed. But as we all know, that's not a guarantee when the goal of humanity is to further expand across the land with concrete and asphalt. Surely enough, the place is being threatened by humans and the various animals and plants that they introduce into the area. There are only about 18,000 people within it, and most of them are the ancient Aboriginal tribe that had first resided in Australia. Number 6. Omiya Khan 
How cold are you willing to get in order to prove how tough you are? It's not hard to talk about the coldest places on Earth because there are spots where winter hits the hardest. And in Russia, one is known as the Saka Republic and you'll find Omiya Khan. When winter comes, it's quickly established as the coldest permanently inhabited area in the world. It's so cold there that it can reach below 55 degrees Celsius. And yet, people are willing to live there for some reason. The reason it gets so cold is that the area traps winds and thus makes a colder climate. So don't go there unless you have some really super warm clothing. Number 5. Barrow, Alaska they say that if you want to lose yourself in the world and potentially make a new start in life, you need to go somewhere like Alaska. Because it's the last frontier for many, and it's easily one of the most isolated places in the United States. Not the least of which is because it's one that isn't even connected to the US. It's connected to Canada. Whatever, I digress. But even with Alaska, there are places that are more isolated than others, and the town known as Barrow is a perfect example of that. You can't drive to Barrow, you have to take a plane from Anchorage to get there and it's about a 90 minute flight. And once you're there, you're not only dealing with the cold, you're also dealing with the dark. Their winter has 65 days of pure darkness, so it's a perfect place for vampires or goth kids or both. It's also not the cheapest place to reside in. After all, isolation means that you can't necessarily get supplies on the regular. So if you want a single jar of peanut butter, you're going to have to be willing to pay about $10 for it. And I'm going to guess that there aren't that many high paying jobs in Barrow to begin with. Finally, the population is so small there that there are more caribou in the area than people. But if that sounds like your kind of place, then by all means you should have at it. Number four. The Sentinelese Tribe Now, as I've already discussed, there are a few ancient tribes of people that are still left in the world that have absolutely no desire to mingle with the modern world as their ways of living still sustain them to this day. And when it comes to the Sentinelese, they really don't want you to come into their home. By that, I mean that if you are stupid enough to go to their isolated place of residence, they're more likely to murder you first and then ask questions never. You've been warned. They live on the North Sentinel Island, which is close to India, but is far away from the traditional travel routes in the ocean. For example, it's not near shipping lanes, and it's not easy to boat to due to the reefs and other natural barriers. That has helped the Sentinelese tribe to stay away from the modern man, and they've been very aggressive to those who dare to try to come to their shores. So little is known about them that nobody honestly knows how many people are on the island. The best guess is a few hundred, but we see so very few of them by design that nobody knows for sure. What is known is what comes from a rare account that highlighted what the village was like. They live in huts, they eat fish, fruit, and animals that they can hunt, and they're well trained in arrows and spears, having shown that over and over and over again. Not the least of which was when an escaped convict thought that he had found freedom by making it to the island, only to be discovered by a search party later on. He was not only very dead, but he was also full of arrows, and the tribe had slit his throat. Whether we want to accept it or not, the Sentinelese tribe wants to live in isolation, and for now, it's probably best that we let that happen. Number 3. The Siwa Oasis If you're traveling through a desert, the thing that you want to see more than anything is an oasis. After all, if you're low on water and you don't know where to go, that can be your only way to survive. But what may surprise you is that in Egypt's western desert, there's a place known as the Siwa Oasis that is so much more than you would expect. Mainly because it's not only an oasis, it's a place where people actually live. The oasis itself is over 500 kilometers from Cairo, so it's not exactly something that people just decide to go and visit. However, if they do, they will be in for a treat. This oasis is one of Egypt's best western desert oases, with thousands of palm trees and gorgeous hot springs. Not to mention, it also features a wonderful lake with a nice green hue. 
As for the local Siwa people, they're so isolated in terms of the rest of the country that they actually speak their own language. And while there are hotels and other luxurious amenities there, the way of life is preserved above everything else. For example, you cannot have alcohol, and the women of the area are not going to be cozying up to visitors that approach. All of that being said, if you do go there, you're going to be amazed by the slow, yet very pleasant way of life that these people have, showing that even within a desert, there can be a nice way to live. Number 2. Palmerston Do you know the old phrase, I'd follow you to the ends of the earth? Well, there is no technical end to the earth, as it's a sphere, and thus you would just keep on going around and around. But if you did want to go to a place that felt like it was the end of the earth, well, you would need to go to Palmerston. This island is part of a reef within a lagoon near the Cook Islands, and the trip there is anything but simple or smooth. I'm talking nine days of travel on a boat through the Pacific Ocean, and that's if you don't get something like a tropical storm or even scurvy to hinder your progress. Once you get to the island, it's actually a nice place, and it has a small population of 62 people. You'll also see some shipwrecks from others that have tried to get to or around the island and hit the reefs instead. <laughs> Whoops. While the people do try to make a nice living out there, it isn't easy. They get at least two transport ships with supplies per year, and the rest of the time they have to make do with what they have. It is the pinnacle of isolation, but if you're able to make it there, you'll be treated nicely and very well fed to boot. Number 1. The Meteora Monasteries Finally, we have the Meteora Monasteries, and they are one of the most important complexes of their kind in the nation of Greece. High up on the cliffs in the country, they're actually so high up that when the fog rolls in, monasteries literally look like they're floating on air. One of the ironies of these buildings is that nobody exactly knows when they were built. There are some guesses, however, that they were built around the 11th to 12th centuries based on a certain group that worshipped at one of the monasteries that was there. Fast forward to these days, and those monasteries are now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, ensuring that they'll be protected for as long as humanly possible. That's all from the realm of the most isolated places on the planet and what makes them so isolated. Were you shocked by some of the locations that you saw today? And which ones would you honestly be willing to go to? Perhaps there are more isolated places on Earth that could have made this list. Let me know all about everything in the comments down below. Be sure to check out the other cool things that are showing up on your screen right now, and I'll see you next time. I love you.